This training video is brought to you by K-Alliance. K-Alliance provides high-quality instructor-led training videos for desktop, IT and soft skills. Visit us online at www.kalliance.com to sign up for your free 7-day trial. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching and we hope you learned something new. Real learning, real videos, real success. In this demo, we're going to be looking at creating new databases within our SQL Server environment. We'll both look at it from the GUI perspective, the graphical user interface, as well as looking at doing it through our T-SQL. In addition, we want to look at the different ways that we can manage files and file groups and how they affect our databases. So let's go ahead and bring up our Management Studio. And we'll start off by looking at this from the GUI perspective. If I come over to my Databases folder in my server and I right-click, and I select New Database. I get my New Database dialog. From this dialog, I'm able to create my new database name. We'll just call it New DB. You'll notice as a part of this, it sets up the initial files that are required. So we have the New DB file and the New DB underscore log file. And our New DB file is part of the primary file group, which is the default file group for every new database. We can see that it has an initial size set for each one that has its auto growth and its max size settings in place. And if I wanted to change or manipulate those, I could by clicking on the ellipse button and then changing the settings. Do I want to do my file growth by percentage or by megabytes? Do I want to set a maximum file size? Those are all things that are available to me. I can also change the path of where that file is going to be stored, which is currently in the data folder within our default SQL Server file path and I can even give it a separate file name if I so choose. So those are some of the basic settings that are available when I'm building my new database. We notice that we use that primary file group because it's the only one we have available. So we have the primary file group listed under our file groups page. Note that from here you're able to add new file groups through the GUI. You can also under your general add new files with the add button from our general page. So we can manage a number of different things in the building of our initial database right from this screen. We'll keep it in its defaults and we'll add some other things with the T-SQL in a moment. So we hit OK and we note that the new DB now exists as a part of our server environment. Now once we have that in place we can manipulate it and change things about it. But Before we do so I want to show you the building of a database from the T-SQL side. So same exact outcome but this time we're creating it with nothing but T-SQL. So here we're creating a new database called branch and it has to have two different on statements one for the files for the actual data for branch and one for the log and its file so we've got branch so create database branch on the file name will be branch underscore dat the location of that file is going to be the D drive MKTG folder branch.mdf the initial size is going to be 100 megabytes and the max size 500 megabytes with a file growth of 20% per growth incident. We're also going to create the log on the following data. The name will be branch underscore log. The location, we're actually going to change this to the D drive, marketing branch.ldf. And then we're going to set a size of 20 to start with a max size of unlimited and a file growth of 10 megabytes per growth incident. So these settings get us the exact same thing that the GUI got us but we can see the details and we set them as we go and we can run this statement in one pass. Oh, I already have a branch one, sorry. Let me remove branch. Here's an exercise in deleting databases too. When you delete a database, you also need to make sure you close any existing connections to that database, otherwise it'll give you an error when you try and delete it. There we go. Now I can run this query. And as it creates this database, it's allocating that initial space, setting all of our properties, building the actual MDF and LDF files. And if I refresh my database folder, we now have our branch database. And if we look at the properties of either of these, we'll note that the settings that we put in place are in fact the settings that it's using for this environment. So we can see that it built the thing with the branch name. Under its files, we have our branch underscore dat and our branch underscore log with the initial settings as well as the percent growth and the size limits. 
that we put in place. So everything that we did in the T-SQL is directly reflected inside of the GUI. So that's the creation of our databases. Once we have our databases in place, we want to start thinking about what all these files and file groups do. So in this example with Branch, we created a single MDF and a single LDF. And when we built our new DB, we did the same thing. We had the single new db.mdf and the new db log .ldf. So we had those base files. But when we actually want to add additional files, this gives us a number of interesting benefits. So we're going to come into our new DB here, and we're going to create a new file. So notice we are altering the database, new DB, and we're adding a file that's going to have the name new DB2. And it's going to have a location on the D drive in the same place as the other one with the new DB2.ndf. Any secondary files that you create for storing data will have NDF. Only the primary one will have the MDF. And that's the general convention within SQL Server. Now, when we build out these additional files, they don't all have to be stored in the same place. I could store them on any hard drive I wanted to. And there are some real performance benefits to having them be on different hard drives. Notice that we're setting an initial size for this new NDF file and a file growth for it. Within this environment, once I have multiple files, it's going to round robin data. What does that mean? That means that every new record that puts in, it's going to spread the data between the two data files as it goes and try and keep them evenly sized as much as possible. So we'll go ahead and we'll create this new file. Now if we actually go check our properties for our new DB, under our files you'll see there's now a new DB and a new DB2. Now with that in mind, and notice here, they are on different drives in this case. So I have my original one on my C drive and my second one on my D drive. That would mean if these were two different hard drives that I would have two different spindles handling requests against these different files, which can really improve performance. So with that in mind, we now have our new file. Now we need to add some data to it to see how this works. So and as a matter of fact, before we even do that, we're going to go back and we'll look at our reports, standard report, reports, standard reports, disk usage. So you can see where we're at right now. So notice we've got our basic file for our new DB. It's got the eight megabytes in size, data file space usage of seven megabytes, transaction log of one. With a lot of unallocated space, we can see where we currently stand within this environment though. Now, we're going to throw a whole bunch of data at this thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to select star and do into a new table called prospect from our market dev database, marketing prospects. And that's the database that we see right here, market dev. Within its tables, we have marketing.prospect. So we're going to pull the data from this other database into our existing one to populate it. And what you're going to find is that as a result of this action, it's going to spread that data across both of our different files that we created. So again, when we're in here, the other thing I want to show you real quick is that if we expand our disk usage by data file, we can see that there are two data files. And currently, the first one, the primary one, has 2.3 megabytes used, and the second one only has 64K because we haven't added any new data, so it has very minimal usage at this point. Now, when we go ahead and we run our select star into, it's going to both create the table and pass the data into it. So we're using our new DB, and we're creating the table and passing all that lovely data in. It's got a fair number of records, so this is going to affect our growth in a lot of ways. So while that's running, oh good, just finished, notice it was 19,955 records that it passed in. If we go back to our disk usage, I'll just run the report again so you can see the steps. Right click, reports, standard report, disk usage.
We have a whole different outcome now. Our total space jumped significantly to 52 megabytes, 26 in the actual data, and another 26 in the log. And if I expand now my usage by data files, what we see is it's evened things out a bit. So our new DB has 12.88 megabytes, and our new DB2 has 11 megabytes. And again, the reason you're seeing this is that it does a round robin. So as new data comes in, it tries to equally distribute it across each of the files in your system. And we can see where those files are stored. Now, we don't know exactly which records went where. We just know that it's evenly distributing the data across these two different files. So that gives you a sense of why you might, might want multiple files, because it gives you the ability to move that data across different structural elements of your architecture. So if I have different hard drives or different storage areas, I can move different data into those simply by creating additional files. Now, one of the other things that we see with that report, let me bring that back up again, is that in this report, because of the amount of data that we were adding in and how small our database started, it had to do a whole lot of auto grow and shrink operations in order to get all that data in. So recognize, when you start from a very small data file with very small incremental growth, it actually makes the server have to work way harder because it not only has to put the data in, but it has to continually grow the database as a separate operation. So all these were extra operations that might not have been necessary if our database had been larger to start with. Now one of the things we can do about that is you can modify the actual sizing of your database before you do large inserts. So here I'm altering my new DB and I'm changing each of my files to be a much larger size right now. So I'm able to alter the database and change how much space is allocated. Had I done this before I did the insert, it would have improved the performance because it would not have had to do all those auto grows. So if we look back at that report, and we'll refresh it, you'll notice we have a lot of unallocated space now because we grew everything significantly. And if we look at the growth that it did, we still have the prior growth, but the last jumps were bigger increments. It's all about how this is managed. And if we look at our space on our data files, we see that there's 100 in each one, but that we have not actually filled that space. So we can do a single jump up prior to doing the incremental growth, and that's significantly more efficient than letting it try and auto-grow on its own. Of course, you'd have to know in advance how much data you intended to put in to get a sense of what you should grow it to. Now, that's working with our files at the database level. But we can go a layer deeper than this as well. We can actually work with our files and our file groups all the way down to the table level. Now, the reason we do this is so that we can target a table and force the data to go directly to a particular file group. So what I'm going to do through the GUI here is I'm going to create a new file group for my branch database and a new file to go with it. So we'll right click and we'll go to our properties. And we're going to create two new elements here. We'll come in and we'll set a new file. Notice we have our branch dat, and I believe we're going to call that branch dat2. So we'll go ahead and add a new file. And actually, I'm going to remove that file. Before I add the file, I'm going to add the file group first. So I'm going to add a new file group, and we're going to call this data underscore fg for file group. So I now have a new file group called data fg. Now I'll create the new file, which we will call our branch underscore dat2. But this one, we're going to change its file group to be data fg. So again, I created a new file group, and then I've associated my new file with that file group. The act of doing this means that I now have a file group that I can use as a pointer for my tables. So when I'm working with a particular database, if I create a new table called product, 
So nothing fancy here. I'm using my branch database. I'm creating a product table that has a product ID, a name, a cost, and a list price. And then I'm going to take a look and see what it did with that particular table. So if we look at this, what we're doing is we're going against our system indexes and our data spaces to see what file group that table was put inside of. And we see that for the object named dbo.product, it was placed in primary. So that's the default file group. That means if you don't tell it where to put it, it's going to force it into your primary every time. All right, so we're going to go ahead and drop that table and re-add it. This time, we're going to create it with an on statement that tells it which file group we want it to be associated with. Notice, I do not put it directly on the file. I associate the table with the file group, and that will associate the, anything that goes into this table with the file that is associated with this file group. That's the way you bridge the gap and bring these things together. So I've recreated this table, and if I check it with that same query against our data spaces again, I see that now it is, in fact, a part of the data file group. Now, I could also go in and I could change what my default is. So if I alter my database, I can modify the file group data FG to be the default. And if I do that, from this point forward, any new tables that are created will be put into data FG automatically. So we're going to create another table called contact. And as you can see, once that runs, we can look up contact from our data spaces and see, yep, it's now being added into the data FG, even though I didn't specify an on statement. So whichever one you have marked as your default is the one that it's going to go to. Now, once you've set these up to be on a particular file group, remember that any data that goes into those tables, like contact, will be associated with the data FG file group. And if we look at our branch properties, our data FG file group was tied directly to our branch dat2, which means any information from there is going to go into this C drive location, not the D drive location of our original branch dat. So I'm actually storing now specific table data on a specific drive. And we can get some real performance benefits from this by allowing different spools to be handling the I.O. against specific data for specific tables, especially when they're used in conjunction. So if I'm joining two tables together, having them be on different spindles can affect performance in a very positive way. So with that, I hope you now have a better understanding of creating databases, working with their files, and working with their file groups. We hope you enjoyed this preview video. Please click on the like button below if you did and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to visit us at www.kalliance.com to sign up for your free seven-day trial today. You could learn a lot in a week.